Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Brian uh, Diefenderfer. Uh, he's an associate principal research scientist at the Virginia Transportation Research Council, which is the research division of Virginia Department of Transportation in Charlottesville, where he's worked since 2004. His research focuses on providing better tools for VDOT to use when designing rehabbing its uh, pavement network. Uh, he's a member of the Association of Asphalt Paving Technologists and of the TRB Committee on Pavement Rehabilitation. Brian has his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in civil engineering from Virginia Tech and is a registered professional engineer in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And his, his uh, presentation is going to kind of focus on cold in place recycling and uh, five-year performance evaluation on Interstate 81, which I was actually able to go see when it was being constructed. So I'm looking forward to the presentation and I have to figure out how to get your presentation on here. Thank you very much for uh, for coming this morning to to the presentations down here in the uh, in the dungeon or the freezer, whatever you want to call it. Um, thank you, Scott, and thank you for the uh, conference organizers for giving me the chance to come talk about the work that we're doing. Uh, title of my presentation is "Building Sustainable Pavements in Virginia Using In-Place Recycling." So a little outline on what I want to talk about, uh, what is in-place recycling, or what is pavement recycling, some of the benefits, that I'll gloss over those. We've had those the first two uh, speakers here this morning have talked and done a really nice job about showing the benefits. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the design inputs and some of the testing we've done, some performance examples that Scott alluded to, one of the sections we want to, uh, that we have done some work with, uh, some performance examples of the re recycling work we've done, and then I've, I've got a kind of exciting thing that's a, a next step that we're taking, uh, kind of further our, our, our work in the area. So in general, what is pavement recycling? It's a series of processes where we can reuse existing materials um, in a new or rehabilit rehabilitated pavement structure, a very generic definition. A couple things that I'll touch on here in this presentation, full death reclamation, cold in place recycling, and cold central plant recycling. And I'll use a lot of acronyms like a good government employee. I'll call these uh, FDR, CIR, and CCPR. Some of the benefits, again, that have been touched on earlier, uh, these are reported in many, uh, many articles in the literature. Anywhere between 30 and 50 percent uh, cost savings on average. In cases greater than 50 percent less greenhouse gases are emitted. A lot of times we can fix the deterioration causes rather than the symptoms. Uh, I know for a lot of examples that I use, talking to the folks in Virginia, the, uh, the district pavement people, a lot of our treatments cover sort of what they think they can afford, which often does not cover whatever deterioration mechanisms happening within the pavement. It's simply a, a, a mill and fill operation. We get a couple more years of life out of it. But there's a lot of activity going on underneath the pavement that they're not addressing. And the recycling options let us get into those sections and actually actually repair the fix uh, or repair the, um, repair the cause of the deterioration rather than try to fix the symptoms. Also, it can be quicker than full reconstruction. There are many examples of that, again, in the literature on being able to accelerate the construction time. Some of the things that I wrote down as, uh, you know, when Steve Cross asked me to talk about pavement recycling to the group, a couple of things I thought were important to include were needs that we have for pavement recycling. And I broke those up into two things, design and construction. Um, in terms of design, there's still a need for familiarity with the recycling processes. A lot of folks are still not cognizant of what, what the recycling processes can do for them or maybe even how to apply them, uh, let alone the design inputs that are needed. Um, we're doing, I think, a fairly good job or have done a fairly good job with the empirical design inputs, things such as layer coefficients, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the ME side, the mechanistic empirical side for, for pavement recycling materials, uh, which I'll touch on here in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of construction, there is a need for rapid quality assessment instead of taking uh, a core of material that you have to wait, let's say, six or eight weeks to core it, and then it's a three or four day test procedure. Um, we need to develop rapid quality assessments and we've talked to a few people here. There's an NCHRP project coming out, hopefully to address that topic. Uh, and also long-term performance assessment. There are a few articles here and there talking about long-term performance. A few of them tend to be more towards the lower volume road range. There's not a lot of information, but a little bit of information on higher volume roadways. And, and I'll touch on that uh, with some of the work that we've done as well. In terms of the ME material property inputs, I was lucky to work with folks like uh, Chuck Schwartz, uh, Mike Marshall, and, and Todd Thomas on the NCHRP 951 project. Um, unfortunately, Chuck and I are talking at, at the exact same time. and so. He and I coordinated, so there's a little overlap between our presentations. So if you feel like you're missing something, maybe you've caught it here, because uh, Chuck may be presenting some of the same stuff. Um, we characterized cores from uh, 23 projects from there around the U.S. and around uh, uh, in Canada as well for asphalt-stabilized CIR, CCPR, and FDR. And we 
characterize these materials by looking at their stiffness and the rotting properties. And the stiffness, we measure the dynamic modulus in the lab and also the repeated load permanent deformation test, which is, uh, if you're familiar with the flow number testing, it's the uh, same test procedure. I want to show you some of the examples of the test to help uh, maybe identify or, or demonstrate some of the things that we found um, that I thought were really interesting. This is a, uh, um, a series of, uh, I don't know if data clouds is the right way to look at it, but a series of the uh, dynamic modulus master curves for each of the recycled processes. Uh, and what I'm showing here, the stiffness going up the left and the right axis in terms of either metric or English units. Um, but the, the way the test is run, we run the test at different frequencies and different temperatures, and then you combine it into this master curve. And that's why the x-axis is showing reduced frequency. So the, uh, the side of the figure to the left is going to be the, uh, the, the um, excuse me, the high temperature data points. The data points over to the, uh, to the right side of the figure are going to be the low temperature data points or low temperature end of the testing. Um, what I thought was most interesting was really the great overlap between the three processes uh, on, this, on these curves. Um, I also found what I thought was really interesting was that the FDR uh, really kind of fell in the middle between the two treatments. FDR, if we're talking about maybe uh, empirical, um, empirical design values, we tend to, we, a lot of other folks too, tend to use lower values or lower strength values for FDR than the CIR and CCPR. However, based on the test that we found, we found that the similar, the stiffnesses are similar. And in fact, on the, uh, on the high temperature and the FDR may actually be stiffer in some cases. We also went and looked at differences between foam and emulsion. Uh, again, a lot of overlap here. Based on some of the work that we've seen that uh, the folks down at NCAT have done recently, they're finding very little differences between foam and emulsion, CIR and CCPR, and I think we, we uh, kind of found the same thing. However, if you look at the extreme temperature ends, there are some differences. Uh, at the very high temperature end or the lower stiffness, the foamed asphalt seems to be slightly, slightly stiffer than the, uh, uh, than the emulsion. And this is across CIR, CCPR, FDR, all the treatments are, are hidden inside of there. One thing we also wanted to look at were the presence of chemical additives. In this case, the chemical additives that were included in the, in the cores that we had were lime and cement. A uh, thing we found very interesting is that even though these cores were collected somewhere between 12 and 24 months after construction, we still found a stiffness difference when the chemical additives were used versus when they were not used. Uh, a lot of the literature, and in fact, the, the working guide on uh, cold recycling talks about how um, chemical additives are used for early term strength. Well, we're showing through the research work that we've done that there's a long-term benefit as well. So you can see, especially at the high temperature end on the uh, left side of the graph, that the chemical additive stiffness is much less than when lime or cement were used. Uh, also interesting, the amount of overlap, especially towards the low temperature end and also between the lime and the cement itself. It's difficult to show the permanent deformation data. I'm trying to show it the same way, but there's so many overlapping lines that, uh, that it's kind of difficult to, difficult to see what's going on. Um, if you're familiar with the flow number test, this is really the same thing, except we don't identify a flow, a flow point. What we're trying to do is test these materials just and carry out the test for as far as we can go. Um, these tests were all done confined, um, 10 PSI confinement, which we think more realistically represents what's happening in the field. Uh, and as you can see, the, the data, again, there's a lot of overlap in the data, which we, we thought was very interesting. One thing I want to point out, and I don't know if I've got a laser pointer that I'll, yeah, I do. Um, the FDR, is within this window, these, these blue lines in here. So as you can see, similarly to the, uh, to the dynamic modulus data, the dynamic modulus show that the FDR tend to be stiffer. The repeated load permanent deformation testing show that the FDR had less deformation than the CIR and the CCPR. Again, uh, kind of counterintuitive to what we might ordinarily expect, but interesting data. Uh, one thing I did do is I overlaid, we did some similar work on a 25 millimeter base hot mix asphalt mixture that we use, or a series of them, and I put the average numbers in here, and that's where they fall in. So the uh, permanent deformation resistance of the recycled material is very similar to our, our base mix asphalt mixtures that we, that we normally use. Um, or excuse me, these are, <laughs> these, are, these are my color codes, and when I put in the, uh, the, um, the base mix, that's the black with the, with the yellow outline, that's our base mix, uh, base mix results from three or four different uh, base mixtures averaged together. So again, very, very comparable to the, uh, to the recycled materials. However, the, again, the big caveat that I want to put in here is the tests were all done confined. If you un test these materials unconfined using this test, the recycled materials perform very poorly. But I think the uh, confined test really simulates better what's happening in the field. So a couple of performance examples that I want to talk about. Um, 
mentioned the Interstate 81 project that was constructed in 2011. And then we also sponsor three test sections at the NCAT test track, the National Center for Asphalt Technology. Uh, both of these are very high, high volume sections, lots of, uh, lots of easels being put on these pavement sections. And the way I've, I've been thinking about these, that if we can get, uh, show that recycled materials and recycled designs can work in these environments, then we can go just about anywhere else with them. Uh, the Interstate 81 project was constructed in 2011 and carries about 24,000 vehicles a day with about 28% trucks. So it's a little, about 6,400 trucks per day uh, directionally. Uh, the NCAT test tracks, were the three sections we were involved with were constructed during the 2012 test, uh, test rebuild, and they've carried uh, about 10 million easels per cycle. So they're in their second cycle now, so they've already survived the first 10 million easels. I want to talk about the right lane side for the uh, I-81 project. The right lane work consisted of a, uh, of a mill, an FDR, a CCPR, and then an asphalt overlay. And we had two sections on that work, uh, a four and a six inch asphalt overlay over top of six inches CCPR over top of 12 inches of FDR. Uh, in essence, all the material that was moved off the project, milled from the project was stockpiled and then it was put back through the CCPR process. Uh, we periodically have been monitoring that project since, since 2011 and the last round of testing we did was back in July. Uh, and it, it had hit about the 10 million easel mark at that point. And we were measuring about a tenth of an inch of rutting and about 44 inches per mile in terms of the IRI. So outstanding performance <laughs> for these sections given the amount of traffic they've seen. We also sponsored the following year in 2012, three test sections at the NCAT test track. Uh, for those of you who have free time in your calendar next month, I encourage you, there's an Aero semi-annual meeting at NCAT that will be talking about these and, and some of the other recycling work that they're doing. So please, uh, please, Please try to attend that if you're able to. Three sections that we placed were N3, N4, and S12. Uh, the way they, they number things in the test track, they have a north, north tangent and a south tangent, and then each section is just, uh, just, uh, um, just numbered sequentially as they go down the track. So N3 and N4 are just the third and fourth sections on the north side. S12 is just the 12th section on the south side. But those are the three that we're involved with. In terms of the cross section of the three, three sections, N3 and N4 were set up to be really a comparison between the two overlay thicknesses, very similar to the I-81 project that we did. The big benefit about the work at NCAT that we were not able to do on 81 was that all these things are instrumented. So they're strain gauges and pressure cells uh, inside the pavement sections. So we're getting a lot of data on the, on the life of these sections that we weren't able to get on the 81. Um, I just couldn't handle all the work on 81 plus sampling and, and whatnot. So anyway, for the N3 and N4, we can look at the uh, difference in the overlay thickness. And then N4 and uh, S12, is essentially the same except for the presence of the, uh, the cement stabilized or the FDR layer for replacing the aggregate layer. So it's telling us a lot about the influence of the foundation. Uh, as of August 2016, these sections have experienced about 14 million easels of traffic. So again, they've gone through the first 10 million easel cycle and they're not quite halfway through the second, second cycle right now. And we're seeing the neighborhood of 0.15 to just about a quarter inch of rutting in those sections, which again is, I would say, good performance given the traffic level. And the biggest thing that we have seen is, well, haven't seen is the cracking. There's absolutely no cracking in the three sections. Uh, I spoke with Dave Tim last week, and he walked the sections and took some photographs and sent them to me, and no cracking at all, which, again, is, is great news. One example of the data that I want to show in terms of the, uh, the strain data are the strain data with temperature for the three sections. Um, the top curve is the four inch overlay over the CCPR. The middle curve is the six inch overlay over the CCPR. And then the bottom curve is the four inch overlay over top of CCPR over top of FDR. And so you can see with the three sections, we've got quite a difference in strain uh, over the temperature ranges for them. Uh, it's, it has surprised us even over at the high temperature range, which you can imagine in Alabama is a much longer period of time than it is in Virginia, that uh, we haven't seen more deterioration in the sections given those high strain values at the high temperature. Um, the thing that has really encouraged us, however, is on the section S12, the low strain values over the entire temperature range. And in fact, these uh, strain gauges are located at the bottom of the CCPR layer. And it tend leads me to think that we may be in a perpetual pavement section with that uh, section S12, because we're down in the, in the 200 microstrain range for the for a majority of the strain data. Interestingly enough, a paper that Dave Tim and his folks had presented at one of the Long Life Pavement Conferences um, a few years ago looked at two different sections they had, N8 and N9, that were a 10 inch asphalt and a 14.4 inch asphalt. And the strain data really lines up pretty well for the sections that, uh, that we put in, which I thought was very interesting. It's something I haven't gone through and, and worked on yet, but we can do cost comparisons between these sections. Um, what I would say so far is similar performance, but uh, we could look at cost comparisons between these sections, see what kind of cost differences there might be. Work to be done yet. 
thinking a little more about that section S12 of the NCAT track, if we take the amount of wrap that we used in the surface mix, which uh, I believe the upper layer may have been a 15% wrap because it was an SMA, so we don't put as much wrap in the SMA. The uh, bottom layer, the, the second asphalt overlay layer was a, a, a dense graded mix and probably had 30% wrap in it. The CCPR, of course, is 100% wrap, and then the FDR was the existing aggregate on top of the subgrade, so it's 100% recycled material. If we average all that stuff together, uh, the design on this section has an average of about 81% recycled material. And so uh, if you think about rebuilding sustainable pavements or even constructing new sustainable pavements, I think this is a great opportunity and a great way we could, we could be doing it. Uh, in addition to some of the strain data that I showed, I think we may have a perpetual design from this. So taking that same idea, we were presented an opportunity or we, or we kind of stuck our foot, our foot in the door. Um, there's a pavement reconstruction project happening on the eastern side of Virginia down in the Williamsburg, Williamsburg uh, Norfolk, Williamsburg, uh, Yorktown area, where they're taking the existing uh, Interstate 64 that's two lanes wide in each direction and adding a uh, full lane to the inside and a full 12 foot shoulder to the inside of that. Uh, the existing pavement consists of uh, a jointed concrete based, built in the late 1950s and an executive decision was made to replace that concrete, totally, totally reconstruct it. So we went and talked to the folks that were in charge of this thing, this design build project, and said that, you know, hey, what if we did something similar to what we did at NCAT, what would you think about it? And so we made a presentation to them. So again, adding two lanes to the inside, and then they'll shift traffic to those two lanes and then reconstruct the existing two lanes and eventually open up uh, two full-size shoulders on either side of three travel lanes, both directions. Uh, it's about 7.08 miles, so if you count all the lane mileage together, it's about 56 lane miles worth of work. And the project, using this design, um, four inches of asphalt over six inches of CCPR, uh, on the new pavement side, the contractor elected to use a cement-treated aggregate foundation on the reconstructed side, elected to use a FDR process under the existing concrete. Um, this, using that design, the, the project was awarded back in January. We expect to go to construction probably sometime next year. To put some numbers on it, um, we found, I think the number I'm probably I'm most comfortable with is the cost savings number, the 34% cost savings per square yard based on the conventional design that we, uh, that we had anticipated using and then the recycled design that was actually awarded on the project. The uh, environmental, the environmental uh, greenhouse gas reduction in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents, 90% uh, reduction is probably, a, uh, um, probably optimistic. If you go through, this is based on some numbers that I took from a TRB paper where they looked at CIR rather than CCPR. There's not a lot of information out there on CCPR uh, environmental reductions. And so I probably should have looked a little harder before I pulled the presentation together. If, if I were to do that and looking at some of the work that Chuck Schwartz has done recently that I think he's actually talk, talking about in this session right now, um, if we were to use his numbers, we'd probably be in the 45, 50% neighborhood. So it's somewhere in, in between these two. It's still significant. Uh, it's still something, unfortunately, that we're not counting as an agency, as a DOT, uh, these, type of, these type of savings. If I had not been able to show cost savings on these, I don't think we'd really be going forward with the project, but we were able to show significant cost savings. Um, stepping back to the, to the project, one thing I don't mention in here is the cost savings number. The cost savings number we calculated was about $10 million on this one project, um, essentially from replacing the conventional with the recycled material. The project quantity for CCPR on this project is 168,000 tons. 168,000 tons of CCPR, quite a bit of material. Well, where do we get this material from? Um, we used or conducted a study about three or four years ago where we had some folks in our office went around to the various contractors and tried to uh, estimate how much wrap is stockpiled. Um, unlike uh, the presentation earlier, in Virginia, the contractor retains ownership of the wrap. And the contractors are, especially in what we call the, the urban crescent, that extends from Washington, D.C., down through Fredericksburg, Richmond, and towards, east towards the Hampton Roads region. Uh, they're swimming in wrap. They're overloaded with wrap. They're renting land to put wrap on and look, looking for places to put it. So we estimated there were about 4.7 million tons of wrap stockpiled statewide. And I know we didn't touch all the, uh, all the contractors because we, we developed a Google map that was very sensitive and not shared, but I saw it. And uh, I know all the contractors weren't there, so I, I think the number's a little higher, so I added a plus here. But anyway, estimated 4.7 million tons. Well, if I've got 4.7 million tons, what can I do with that? If I were to use CCPR, we could build a 12-foot wide lane six inches thick from my office in Charlottesville to Salt Lake City. If I wanted to do that. If I wanted to do that. I could cover probably a third to a half of our inter interstate system with a CCPR. This is material we have on hand. The wrap material we have on hand, we should be using it. I don't know how much other states have. Um, 
I see Kent in the back of the room. I wish Napa would go through and, and publicize with the wrap information how much wrap is available, it's stored, stockpiled. It'd be great to see. It'd be great to see it. I'd love to see. Maybe I can expand my map here a little bit. But um, anyway, that's what I have for the uh, for the project. This is my information. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to happy to try to address them. You mentioned uh, perpetual pavement. What would be the endurance limit for for the recycled, you know, the cold in place? That's a good question. I don't think anybody really knows. We're yeah, I figured that you didn't know. Yeah, but I've no, <laughs> we're we're taking what we. What we think we know from traditional hot mix materials, like 65, 70 micro strains at the I, bottom of that. I think is on the really. I think that's the really low end. I think we've seen reports in the 150, 175 micro strain end. Uh, of course, depending on the mixture, but nobody's done the, that work on the recycled materials. Yeah, well, what I see in my state, of. you know, we have the same problem with wrap. We only put 15, 20 percent back in, so 80 percent of what we ever milled is sitting in stockpiles because yeah. the environmental people don't let us use it for much else. Yeah. So you know, we could mill up these roads and make a good base and then top them and make a perpetual payment. But I don't, I'm just wondering how, what strength you would need at the bottom of that layer. We're hoping with the NCAT work we can find out, but we haven't failed the pavements yet. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Any other questions? No, chem chemical additive is stiffer than the lime and cement. How, how do you explain that? Only stiffer at the very low temperature side. What it could be, since we mixed, added in all the, uh, all the recycling treatments in here, the no chemical additive is probably more likely to be the cold central plant processes. In this case, I think the ones we sampled from there did not. I think we had one that had a cement additive and two that did not. Most of the, uh, most of the CIR projects we sampled had lime, and of course there was the FDR in there as well. So if most of that curve, the red curve, the no chemical additive came from CCPR, that may explain why. Uh, I, I personally didn't go back in here and try to say which ones of these, were, how many projects were within each one of these just for, but I think that may be some of the reason. Good, thank you. Sure. Going twice. All right, thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you.